the two wives, then maintain two wives. So probably I said so. But my, my father came. And my father said, my dear son, you know, there was such a strong bond of love between them. So Gomohan said, my dear son, not a good idea. Because I know even the girl you like, you know. But then you will get attached. It will be very difficult because on a certain point you will have to give it up. This is not forever. So it will be very difficult. So it's good you don't like your wife. Not difficult to give up. Live with that. And Shiva Prabhupada did. Now Prabhupada also had a words of respect for his wife. It's not like he hated her. Not at all. He had a high respect for his wife. She was, he said, she was a pious Bengali lady. But then Prabhupada mentioned two symptoms of his wife, which we can often identify with. He said, not very intelligent and spoiled. Those two, uh, two features. Not very bright and spoiled. <laughs> so you can say, Prabhupada really knew what he was talking about. That was the beautiful thing about Shiva Prabhupada. He was all rounded personality. There was no subject and issue you could surprise him with. But Prabhupada, I'm married, I have a problem. Prabhupada would say, yes, marriage is a problem. In his letters you write, my dear son, you know, your naughty wife is well known to me. But she is still doing nice service. And you have to understand, wife can be a great friend and she can be also a witch. It depends how it comes. So live with that. Because that's what Prabhupada did. He was raised and lived in a culture. Culture means there's vows, there's principles, which you don't change. Happy, unhappy, you don't change. It's not like in a vest, some pinch comes and, ah! okay, forget it. Let's try another one. You know, this is the Western thing. Some pinch, some discomfort, immediately everything is changed. Everything is a bomb, some new thing, new, 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 new all the time. No, Srila Prabhupada lived very beautifully in a, you could say, in a social context. But being meant for the purpose we see today, to save actually this planet from illusion, Prabhupada, of course, the marriage frame was just a very, it just became very, you could call it claustrophobic, you know, very small. You know, so uh, his wife ultimately couldn't share his preaching, you know, visions. So of course, when Krishna arranged that things had to work out the way that there was simply nothing more to do. Everything, Prabhupada said, Krishna took everything away from him. They have a saying in Bengal that if God wants to give you with his four hands or ten hands, you have not enough to keep it with your two hands. And he wants to take something from you with his four hands or ten hands, then uh, your two hands will not be able to keep it. So Prabhupada was ultimately entirely on Krishna's mercy, retiring to Vrindavan, getting for, ready for the final finish, and finally entering the Western world, which he affected lives of so many we don't have the ultimate count. We don't know how many, you know, uh, <laughs> there's me an incident of a, uh, in America, I think it's still going on, the Temple New Vrindavan. When it was built, that was mostly already in Prabhupada's absence. You know, yeah, there was a big temple just for Prabhupada. Okay? on the hill, which was artificially made. It's a farming community in Virginia. So, uh, and the main preaching was that buses with tourists arrived, you know, to see this. Because Americans don't have culture. If you want to think about Americans, there's no culture. Just Mickey Mouse and bubblegum, mm -hmm. that's it. There's no culture. So when something like this comes up, then it very easily becomes a tourist attraction. So, so many buses came looking at the golden palace in the middle of the hills of Virginia and this and that. 
And then <laughs> it's a little story, you know, the tourists got like tourist guides too, you know, and here is Sri Prabhupada, and here is this, and here is the altar, and here is the deities, and, and then they could go again, you know, uh, home. So, <laughs> so one, <laughs> one day he would have realized that his shoes from Sri Prabhupada, which was there actually, his original shoes which he wear, were wearing during his stay in the temple, they disappeared. Somebody from the tourists stole them. You know, yeah. And then, <laughs> a few months later, an uh, elderly American lady was caught, you know, how she sneaks into the temple and puts the shoes back. <laughs> and the devotees are going, this was you! <laughs> and she said, well, you know, I didn't know it's so precious for you and it's old shoes, you know. Yeah. But I found it kind of interesting. So I took them and then the bus was leaving and then I just took them home. Every day since then, this man is appearing in my dreams telling me I want my shoes back. <laughs> <laughs> so, we don't know. <laughs> you know, we don't know to how many people Prabhupada is talking right now. We don't know. This is not like a Vyana the rubber stamping movement, you know. Come here, it's come. Number, thank you. Ten krona, thank you. Ten krona. Well, it would be nice and simple to manage like this, but it's not. This ISKCON is uh, uh, whenever they are asked, how many members do you have? Well, we have some number, yeah, we have something in a computer, but uh, the database is changing all the time and it's certainly extremely limited. Because we don't know how many people out there are chanting Hare Krishna. When they asked Prabhupada, how do you define membership on ISKCON? He said, well, to the degree somebody follows Bhagavad Gita and chants Hare Krishna and follows the teachings, then he's a member automatically. Of course he's a member, because he follows. But he used to have a member with a number and who pays 10 krona a month and he doesn't follow one thing. So Prabhupada was very practical. There was another feature of Srila Prabhupada he was very, very practical. That way it was so easy to follow. Like, you know, like... Uh, uh, it's an example, one of the devotees during Prabhupada's lecture was fanning him with the chamara, which is regularly done in India. It's also for the flies and insects to chase them away. So he was fanning Prabhupada like this. But he was already so exhausted from all the service that he started to fall asleep by doing this. So it was becoming dangerous. The Chamara always came closer to Prabhupada and he was like... <laughs> and Prabhupada was giving a lecture. <laughs> but Prabhupada was very aware. It's another feature of Shiva Prabhupada. He was aware who is in front of him. He was aware who is behind him. He was... I personally saw it. It was amazing. You know, yeah. So Prabhupada saw this devotee almost. So Prabhupada in the middle of the lecture, he stopped, looked at him, and he didn't even realize Prabhupada was looking at him. He was like, Prabhupada said, go to sleep. <laughs> Practical. <laughs> if you are falling, you know, you know, over, then just go to sleep if you are some time. If you are hungry, eat. You know, Prabhupada was very, very practical. I saw it uh, for the second time, I saw Shiva Prabhupada in France. Uh, I be arrived at like 10 o'clock in the morning after driving non-stop the whole night. New Mayapur is in South France, more or less in the southern part. And then, uh, you know, Prabhupada just came back from the morning walk and the devotees arranged some simple thing like a blanket. It was a kind of warm, nice morning. So Prabhupada sat down and the devotees immediately flocked around listening. It was kind of not official lecture. So they, they were listening what he has to say. And Shri Prabhupada, he was in a very, very poor physical shape already then. And he just, somebody he just suddenly became very firm. And he said, nobody should stand behind me. And I realized that actually, first of all, it's kind of disrespectful. And second of all, that there were some kind of funny people standing there staring at him. Like, Whoa. You know, and Prabhupada didn't look backwards. He didn't saw it. He just said it just like that. And immediately the servant said, shh, 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 shh. 
You know, everybody, if you want to see Prabhupada, come in front. Don't stand behind him. And he was constantly like this. I mean, just from that one uh, visit, I could tell you stories the whole night. But any time I started film rolling back, it was just... Just tell you how Shri Prabhupada attracted people to this movement. We had one uh, Germany in those days already quite a flourishing yatra. We had a just rent new castle. It was those days very popular to rent castles and buy castles, which proved managerially very, very difficult. <laughs> castles are not very practical buildings, you know. They, they are cold and big and, uh, you know, and uh, difficult to clean and breaking apart. And, and so anyway, so we had a castle in Germany too, and we had a distributing lots of books, and Germans were very efficient, showing how, you know, showing the world we are back again, you know. So, uh, I'm not a German, by the way, but I enjoyed this in Germany. So anyway, so, uh, uh, you know, we were very, very, you know, on the top of the game, so to say. So, uh, we had one Bhakta uh, who was aspiring to join us. And he liked to join us, but he had only one problem. He was a boxer, you know. And he was so attached to this boxing that he even carried his boxing gloves all the time with him. Even when the man walked, he was always like, you know, <laughs> difficult to change your arms like this. You know, always, always in the mood, always, you know. So they were saying, well, when you join this movement, the boxing is over. We don't have a really boxing service, not yet. We could employ it in a certain circumstance, uh, occasion, but I'm sorry, it, you know. So he left again, he came again, so many times he left and came. So one uh, Saturday I returned back uh, from book distribution, the temple was empty. I said, what happened? Everybody is gone. And the last devotee who ran out of the temple said, Prabhupada is in France! He is in France! We all left for France. So, I mean, that was always like this, you know, we had like 15, 16 vans, cars. So everybody said, let's go to France, you know, and turn the cars around and just, everybody was going to South France. Mm -hmm. So, me too, I mean, we were all maybe 25 years old, you know, so what, who cares? So we just, I just emptied out the books out of the car, turned the car around, drove down, the castle was like on a hill. So I drove down the road, and there, because it was a weekend, our boxing Bhakta is coming again. So I told him, you know, hey, Prabhupada is in France. You want to have a ride? And he was going, yeah, why not? And then he just dropped into my car. And we drove the whole night completely through France, you know, all of it, non-stop. Uh, I didn't even know where the place is. I never was there. But somehow I was saying Krishna will help me, so I passed the place which was called Paris or something like this. It didn't mean much to me, you know, I was just heading somewhere approximately, I knew where it is. So, you know, so somehow I, uh, and the whole way down, because I didn't have much company, so I keep myself also awake, I was just preaching to him, you know, the whole way, you know, boxing is my you know, and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, just to keep myself, you know, awake. And then we arrived there, and then, uh, as I mentioned, Prabhupada just came from the morning walk, and I lost track of him, he disappeared. There was like around maybe 400, 500 devotees in that castle. So, you know, so it was very, very busy, everything was just so huge, you know, one of these old French, French castles, you know. A huge park, it is wonderful, amazing trees, huge trees, which under one tree could like hundred demonies could sit under one tree. You know? So, uh, and of course, French people know how to make a feast. They are really feasting people, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So uh, the feasts were just hilarious. I mean, it was unbelievable. So, uh, what happened that during the Prabhupada installed the Krishna Balaram deities? And uh, I mean, the festivities were just going for two, three days non stop. It was unbelievable. The Kirtans, you can imagine the atmosphere. The prasadam was beyond anything one had ever eaten before, especially some juice, which was a little bit prickly. I was, hey, this is a really nice juice. It tastes like champagne. 
And the first <coughs> event said, like, mm. <coughs> Don't tell me this is champagne. And they went, no, it's not champagne. We don't drink champagne. No. <laughs> and he said, but really, what is this? So when they would let me down in a, under the castle, there was this huge wine cellars, you know, this, this like corridors, you know, this dark, you know, these places. And there was huge plastic containers. And there was a grapefruit juice inside. A little bit standing around for a few days, like that. I think in Sweden they call it cider, apple cider. Which makes the juice uh, not too alcoholic, but still a little bit alcoholic. You know, I was going, oh no, we are making wine down here. No, it's not, <laughs> oh, it's not wine, it's grapefruit juice. Uh, but you, you put few, you know, so many kilos of sugar in it, let it stand for a few days, but you see what you get. Ah, oh, come on, Prabhu, you're not drinking alcohol, it's just uh, 3 4% or something like that, you know. And I realized, my God, all these festivities, no wonder we were having such a rolling kirtan. Because, you know, we didn't drink one cup, it was very hot. It was a very, very hot period. The whole countryside was just burned. We drank, you know, liters and liters of that thing, you know. And of course, everybody was, hey, how do you want, how do you want? <laughs> I said, we were all a little bit slightly drunk. Because we were in France, of course. <laughs> so that's just a side thing. But Prabhupada loved this feast. He appeared always on the balcony in that castle. And seeing this huge park with these trees, with hundreds of devotees sitting underneath, just feasting, Prabhupada really liked to look at that. But, you know, it was a big castle, and we were all absorbed in the prasadam, and some, suddenly somebody screamed, Prabhupada is on the balcony! And then everybody stopped, you know, and look at the balcony, I remember Prabhupada is standing there, a little figure like this, and his hand is he was going, Prabhupada, keep And Prabhupada was like, you know, blessing everybody. <laughs> just keep on eating, you know, just yeah. keep on feasting. It was an amazing atmosphere. And then Prabhupada departed. That day I remember very well. Uh, it was this big staircase going down. There's a photo from that existing. You know, Prabhupada had to be guarded by his sannyasis, he had his bodyguards, because the pressure and the excitement of the devotees was so great, they would probably crush Prabhupada or something like this. There's a certain mechanism when you have 500 people pushing, you know, it starts to get dangerous. So these sannyasis, they were using their dandas, and dandas can be used for all kinds of purposes. So they used them on like sticks to push the crowd you know, in kind of distance. So Prabhupada finally appeared, was going down the stairs and entered the car and was heading for the airport. Which was impossible for him to leave, because the car was completely jammed with devotees. Totally. So how do you get Prabhupada to the airport like this? And uh, I'm not... Usually when people start to pile up and get too intense, so I usually go aside, I'm not really that kind of in the middle, but as with somebody else who was in the middle. And that was our German boxing bhakta, <laughs> <laughs> whom I saw working himself through the crowd, you know, with all the skills and all the know-how he had. I saw just his devotee flying away and then devotee flying away and like this. And he was heading, making his way through the crowd with the car. <laughs> and finally, very quickly, I was thinking, oh, wow, German boxing guy on the way, okay. So he made it to the car, just to see Prabhupada, who was sitting in the car. Prabhupada had a style to sit in the car. I don't think he ever had a safety belt. The word safety belt was not ever used. But he had a kind of little bit safety device, he had his can. <coughs> And he had his hands on a can like this, which the can was jammed into the ground. So in the case some bumping, he could just jam against the can like this. So he had his hands on the can, sitting just in the window like this. Now what our German Bhakta didn't know, that he may be good on fighting himself through 400-500 devotees to the car, but he cannot avoid that 400-500 devotees will push him against the car. So finding himself being completely closed up, you know, yeah, he practically got so jammed on the car that his face got completely squeezed like this <laughs> on the glass. Still staring at Prabhupada, who was practically this distance away from him. 
So Prabhupada slowly turned his head and looked with his deer-like lotus eyes straight into his eyes. <laughs> the problem is that man couldn't move because he was just slammed <laughs> like a mosquito on that car. So he looks like this, you know. <laughs> Prabhupada was this close, really looking deeply into his eyes. And then somehow the devotees arranged because Prabhupada had to get to the airport. So the driver started to drive slowly while the devotees were gliding on the car and away <laughs> from the car. And somehow nobody got driven over by that car. I remember standing there on the stairs when the car finally made it to this big park to the main gate where it disappeared. The whole park was decorated with this Dandavat paying devotees, you know, it was like fruits lying around. And then finally Prabhupada disappeared. So uh, I think it was the same night I got our German Bhakta in a car and we drove back. And there was no one preaching, it was completely silent. And he was completely just chanting, just not saying anything. And the next day he joined. No more boxing, nothing. Uh, Everybody wondered, what happened? You know, what happened? Why, why suddenly? Where did you go the decision here? Mm. And he said, Prabhupada, looking like this? You think I can live for the rest of my life with this kind of look like this? <laughs> you know? So Prabhupada made devotees to join simply by looking into their eyes. Because the purity of the message was completely clear. Prabhupada was always so kind, you know? But the eyes were sometimes very ferocious. They looked straight through you, into your heart, asking one single question. Why don't you, Rasko, surrender to Krishna now? And people start to go, <laughs> big professors, you know. Big, big dignitaries meeting Prabhupada. It was fun to watch this. Even this were like, wow. This is a big professor and Prabhupada like, yes, you like this movement? Oh yeah, it's a wonderful movement. Then why don't you join now? <laughs> <laughs> and the man was like, I do not say. You know, he realized, my God, he mean it really. This is serious. He really mean what he says. You know, people were horrified about the impact of the purity, you know. It's like, <gasps> You suddenly saw yourself cheating Krishna for the rest of your life. You were completely exposed. And Prabhupada still smiled. You know, it was a terrifying experience, you know. People went home and he said, he just asked me to surrender my life to Krishna. Uh, 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 yeah, I know I should, but no, I have to find some reason why I cannot surrender. You know, but Prabhupada took like all the reasons away. It was nothing except to realize, that's actually how I joined. I was lucky, I was 18, there was not much to clinch on. But uh, I realized if I don't do this now, then for the rest of my life, I will just cheat myself and consequently cheat others. Hello, how are you? This is me, and I have this title, and I have that designation, and we will cheat each other, right? How are you doing? Yes, I'm also a big cheater. You know, and you know, and we are cheating each other. Yes, yes, yes. How can you enjoy me? I will, and you will not enjoy me, I will enjoy you. That's how it goes, you know. This is the dealing with the material world. Just a world of cheaters and cheated. You can have a choice. You can switch around. Sometimes you are cheating, sometimes you are cheated. It goes back and forth like this. So when you came to close to Prabhupada, the whole thing was gone. There was no cheaters, and there was no cheated. There was just Srila Prabhupada asking you, why don't you join us? Why don't you just... Yeah, but, but, but I have a family. Prabhupada said, family can also join. <laughs> yeah, but... but, uh, but uh, you really? They can? Yes. They can also join Hare Krishna. They can also be part of it. Yeah, but I have to work. Prabhupada said, we are working too. Yeah, what about uh, <laughs> Prabhupada was not fanatic. He knew that not everybody can join the temple, but he can be part of this movement. Why not? Find me a reason why not. In the presence of Shiva Prabhupada, it was very difficult to find a what. I have to think about it. Prabhupada said, yeah, that's a mental platform. Finished. Yeah, but I have to think. 
No, but I said, but we already thought about this. We spoke about this, isn't it? Or do you disagree what I say? No, what you say is perfect. Then, then just do it. Yeah, but um, then maybe I can serve uh, God in another way. Prabhupada said, which way? <laughs> Show me. Well, I, I don't know which way. Then well, why don't you take this way? But I'm already serving a uh, God, really. What is his name? I don't know. Jesus. No, it's not God's name. It's his prophet. It's not God's name. So what, what, is, what is God's name? Prabhupada said, we can give you the name, we can give you the address, we can give you the way how to approach him, and we can assure you, when you follow this process, you will be successful. Yes, you will revive and develop your relationship to God again. So, why don't you do it? Now, everything was now with Prabhupada, you know. <laughs> Not like future, and I have to sing and wait, and I don't feel so good about it, and... Who uh, are, you know, no, 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 yeah, yeah. We are doing it now. We are not dying. Do you see anybody dying here? And of course, the happiness of devotees who are engaged in Prabhupada service was so convincing that people are thinking, well, you know, I have to become happy in this too. Instead of being independently miserable, you know, that I am dependently happy. Because independence, what is independence? We are dependent all the time. You must be dependent on somebody or something. So why don't you just hear? And these people live like this. They work, they are happy. Prabhupada said, we are so happy we don't need even a bed. We lay down on the floor happily. <laughs> <laughs> this was very appealing to hippies, you know, because they already lying on the floor already, so what? That was not really the biggest austerity. <laughs> So, life became real, which was Prabhupada, very practical. But now I have to ask if I'm not supposed to stop you for Arctic, or should we keep on going with this? Or I'm not the master of the ceremony. I mean, this is a kind of an Arctic already, isn't it? I, know, I can go like this. <laughs> I think it's no problem. When you come with Prabhupada and talk about Prabhupada, there's no end to it. Because there's another feature of Shri Prabhupada, when you talk about Krishna, Prabhupada, there's no difference. Because Prabhupada was such a transparent media that it was impossible to talk about him without talking about Krishna consciousness. It was totally identical. Yeah. That was no different. His personality was so emanating Krishna consciousness. Like you find sometimes there are so many prophets and so many teachers and so many spiritual, you know, and material teachers and all. But you find sometimes there's a huge discrepancy between their personality and the thing what they teach. <laughs> you know, they say some wonderful thing and then they go home and do something terrible. You know, yeah. Or you find it's actually it's not compatible. You know, yeah. A man is teaching Salibasi only to girls or something like this, or you know, and in the world uh, Prabhupada gave a very rude example, he said, Nobody who is smoking can, can teach how to stop smoking. So Prabhupada said, this is hypocrisy. And that was not there in Prabhupada. Prabhupada related even to the most ignorant ones in such a pure Krishna conscious fashion that he brought the already resident, the dormant resident Krishna consciousness in them out. You need quite some spiritual power. We know it from our preaching experience, you know. We preach here for hours. You, know. you understand? This is Bhagavad Gita. This is logic. Look, we are not this body. Are you the nose? No. Are you the hand? No. And at the end, after two hours preaching, the people look at us and say, well, it's maybe your opinion. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. That's it. 